Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure, Stu. And congratulations on your appointment as Chief. Thank you. It's been about six months now. That's right. Uh, can you give us a little update on how things are going right at the moment uh, now that it's your city to police? Sure. Uh, first six months have been very busy, lots of stuff going on. I think one of the biggest changes I noticed going from deputy chief to chief was that my calendar filled up right away with uh, many different <laughs> events and uh, super busy. So everybody wants to meet with you and community consultations, uh, internal consultations, that kind of thing. So it's been really, really uh, busy six months. So when we take a look at the transition from when Chief Chu was in the position that you're in to, yes. to now, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that he pointed out is that, that over the last eight, nine, ten years, it's really been a management team. Mm -hmm. and, what ha and how has that helped you in the transition into leadership yourself? Mm -hmm. We've got a very strong leadership team at the VPD. Uh, we've grown it within, so it's people that are coming up through the ranks, which we're happy to see. We're not having to go outside and look for um, police officers from other agencies. So. When Jim Chu retired, he left the department in a very good place. I was fortunate to take over a department that's in a good situation. And I promoted Steve Rye, who was one of the uh, superintendents, up to deputy chief. And believe me, we had a lot of good contenders for that position, and it was a, a tough competition, but Steve was the right man at the right time. Yeah, it must be challenging, because when you take a look at the, the makeup of the men and women who are now the Vancouver Police Force, mm -hmm. they're a very talented and professional group of uh, men and women. Absolutely. How important... Uh, is it that the Vancouver Police Force be a professional police force where the, the, the standards of entry are as high as they are? Like, what does that bring to the community in making this a safer uh, city to live in? Mm -hmm. We do have very stringent standards. It is a difficult police department to get into. Uh, we're also a very diverse police department. So we have uh, over 24% of our officers are now female officers, which is a huge change from when I became a police officer back in 1987. We've seen a, a huge increase in female officers, which is fantastic. We're one of the highest in Canada now at uh, almost one quarter. And also a very diverse police force because it is important that the department matches what the community looks like. And we're not quite there, but we're heading in the right direction. Our officers speak 49 different languages, uh, very diverse backgrounds from, you know, family backgrounds from all over the world. So it makes for a really rich police department. And I think the days where you have a, you know, a management team or a police department that's predominantly white males, those days are gone. And we get all different kinds of backgrounds coming in and it helps in the conversations and it helps, you know, give different viewpoints on what's happening in the community and making those community connections. So if we take a look at Maybe I'll get you to give me a brief definition of what the Robert Peel model is. Sure. Because you talked about it's important to have a police force that reflects the community that it polices. Yes. And, I, and, I, and I'm guessing that that lines up with the principles of Robert Peel. Um, right. Maybe you can, you sure. know, for those who don't know who Robert Peel is and, and, and what his philosophy is, maybe you can give us a little background on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Robert Peel was the uh, founder of the Modern Police, the London Metropolitan Police, back in the 18, I think it was 1829 when he founded the London Metropolitan Police in England. And the basic premise behind it was that the public are the police and the police are the public. So, you know, in a Western society like Britain, like Canada, like the United States, we are not an occupying force, we're not a military dictatorship. We are policing by consent and the approval of the community. So it's really important that we have buy-in from the community, we have community trust, we have uh, respect from the community. And in order to do that, we have to outreach to them, we have to connect with them, we have to have officers in our force that are community-oriented and relate well to the public. So it, it's really important that we build those relationships and, you know, through our volunteer programs that we have as well, that, you know, the public is a huge part of the policing model that we have, like our Citizens Crime Watch program, our community policing centers, our cadet program, a number of different initiatives where we have civilians out in the community who are really part of the VPD family and then also that larger trust element that we have with the community at large. And the nice thing about municipal policing, I'll tell you, is that we have so much oversight, which I think really goes towards accountability and public confidence in the police. We've got the Office of the Police Complaints Commissioner, we've got the Independent Investigations Office, and we also have a nine-member civilian police board which oversees the VPD. So that's, that's you know, the formal mechanisms, but there's also informal mechanisms as well through the media, through different special interest groups and people that are always, you know, watching what the police are doing and making sure that we're staying on track. And I welcome oversight. I think it's a great thing. 
Coming back to the idea that the police force reflect the community, yeah. how does that help you uh, fight crime then? Uh, mm -hmm. Does it mean that there's more openness, there's a, a greater willingness to share information and to give the police a heads up at times when there might be something to be aware of? It does because I think people come, I mean Vancouver is a very diverse city. We've got people here from all over the world and it's an amazing city to live in, world class city as you know we always hear in all these surveys. And I think people will have trust in the police if they know that the police can be trusted themselves. They know that they see people in the police force who are you know, from similar backgrounds that they may have come from originally. And we do a lot of outreach to different community groups to make sure that we make those connections. We have officers that speak different languages and we make inroads so that, um, it, you know, it's an interesting thing about crime because people look at crime rates and they say crime's going up, crime's going down. And, and that's one thing that we have to look at for sure. But with regard to crime, a lot of it goes unreported. So there's many things that are going on. And if people don't have you know, a basic trust of the police or confidence in the police to help them out with these instances, that people won't report it. So mm -hmm. it all goes towards that. I got to get you to hang on for just one second sure, while we yeah. take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Thank you. How are we doing as far as crime stats in sure. the city of Vancouver right now? We had very low homicide numbers last year and violent right. crime seemed to be down. Mm -hmm. Up a bit this year. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> Okay, so homicides are up a little bit this year. Yes, they've ticked up, but violent crime in general is down. So if you look at the overall stats for violent crime in 2015, they are heading in the right direction. They're still going down because violent crime includes not just homicides, which is actually a very small number of um, total offenses that we attend, but um, assaults, sexual assaults, robberies, other things that make up the violent crime sort of basket of goods. Those are actually coming down. So we're still heading in the right direction. The one thing that's been a tougher nut to crack for us is property crime. Um, historically, over the last 10 years or so, we have seen a really dramatic decrease in property crime. But in the last couple of years, it started to level off and uptick just a little bit. So that's an area that we are keeping a close eye on. Well, when it comes to addressing violent crime, that mm -hmm. is one kind of prevention. When it comes to yes. dealing with property crime, it, it, it's different. Let, let's yes, talk about is. violent crime. First of all, sure. what are the initiatives that the police can undertake to help address violent crime and to bring those numbers down? Okay. Historically, I would say that we looked at crimes like homicide, for example, as a reactive crime. So you would have a team of homicide detectives and their expertise was investigating murders. And it was sort of a reactive type, um, you know, protocols that we had in place. But we started to realize, you know what, we know a lot of these people that are committing crime in our city. We know who the gangsters are. We know the people that are affecting the marginalized people in our community. So we take a very proactive approach to them now. So what we'll do is we'll set up a team of officers. And we really started this about uh, five to seven years ago, where we'll have a project and we'll say, okay, this group of people in our city, we know they're perpetrating violence. We know that this group is at a very high likelihood to commit a homicide or a violent crime. So we'll target them very aggressively. We'll go after them um, getting search warrants. We'll get wiretap up on them. We'll do surveillance on them. We'll have undercover operations. We'll do covert investigations to break up the group and we'll get them for sometimes violent crimes, sometimes for drug offenses, sometimes for, um, importing narcotics or firearms or conspiracies, different types of offenses. We break up the group, dismantle it, put them in jail to f for five to seven years and disrupt that group and then we move on to the next group. And we're doing that every 90 days. So we're targeting that one group, quick bang, put the report together to Crown Council and then we move on to the next group. So we're hitting groups continuously, not rest on your laurels and keep it moving. That's on the covert side. On the overt side, we also have dedicated officers um, that work again. This is another community partnership with the community in partnerships like Restaurant Watch and Bar Watch. So our gang officers are out seven days a week. They're in the downtown core, which is you know an amazing place to go down and party and the nightclubs and the pubs and the restaurants. It's uh, an amazing place to hang out downtown Vancouver. But our officers are in those bars, making those connections. They know who the gangsters are and we make it uncomfortable for gangsters. So if you're you know, a member of an outlaw motorcycle gang or a well-known uh, organized crime group, the restaurant owners and the bar owners will actually call us proactively or we will see these people in the bar and we remove them from the bar because we want to prevent violence and we do it under our authority under the Trespass Act and agreements we have with the bar owners who don't want those folks in their bars. Is it challenging for you to say, okay, we're going to address or uh, target specific groups 
And then you realize that so many of these groups are coming into the city from other jurisdictions where mm, yeah. you don't have the ability to target them. Right. And so you're having to be reactive. And, and mm -hmm. how do you fight that when you're confined to the city limits of Vancouver? Right. Well, the authority of the Vancouver Police Department is actually anywhere in the province of British Columbia. But of course, our focus is the city of Vancouver because that's we're funded by Vancouver City Council and the Vancouver taxpayers and, and business owners. But um, it's, it's really an interesting issue because Vancouver is a core city for the whole region. We're the biggest city in the province and biggest city in the region, obviously. And Vancouver is a focal point for the entire region. So we've got about 660 roughly people, 660,000 people roughly that live in the city. But there's about 2.6 million people that live in the region. Mm -hmm. And we know from looking at our data that so many people come into Vancouver. You get people coming in for work every day. You get people coming in for arts, culture, social events, BC Lions, the Whitecaps, the Vancouver Canucks. Tourists come here. When people are flying to go on holidays to Vancouver, they end up you know, down on Robson Street in the downtown core. They're not, generally speaking, going out to the suburbs. And because so many people are coming down into the city, at any given time, even though the residential population may be about 660, mm -hmm. you can easily have eight, 900,000 or a million people inside the city of Vancouver, Celebration of Light, for example, right. over a million people easily in the city at any one time. So that does present unique challenges that some of the other cities in the region don't face because we are that core city. So that means that you have to be paying attention to people who could uh, ignite uh, some kind of action who live here but also live elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so your resources are, must get spread thin at times. It can be a challenge, yeah, absolutely. We're dealing with big city issues. Vancouver is you know, not a small place anymore. We've got uh, you know, connections to organized crime in the city and the region that have tentacles you know, across, the, uh, across the Pacific down into the United States and then across Canada to uh, you know, Toronto and Montreal and, and other cities like that. So Vancouver is a bit of a focal point. Um, so big city issues happening, um, that regional influx for disturbances and you know, troublemakers that may come into the city and, and cause problems during big events. So a lo lot of stuff to consider. And one other thing I'll just yeah, mention yeah. is um, offenders, of course, they don't recognize municipal boundaries. So you could have they somebody in Surrey <laughs> or New West and they come into Vancouver to commit crime just as easily as they do anywhere else. So. Got to take another quick break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yet despite these challenges, you're bringing the numbers down. Uh, so we are. Is that solely the work that you're doing or is it changing societal values? Uh, what's happening and then what do we need to do to be able to support that trend that helps you to continue to do that job? I think there's a number of factors. I mean generally speaking if you look at the crime trends across North America that crime generally has trended down over the last 20 years or so and some of that is demographic so mm -hmm. the police quite frankly can't take credit for everything but we can take credit for some things and the drop in crime over the last 10 years in Vancouver has been more dramatic than that in some other cities and some of it is that proactive work I'm talking about like we do with the gangsters and like we do with the violent crime. Also our targeting of um, prolific offenders. So we have chronic offenders that we know um, basically just like you and I go to work every day and we have a job, their job is they're out committing crime every day. Sometimes it's a result of a drug addiction and you know tragic circumstances but that's the way some folks support themselves. So whether it's breaking into houses or businesses or cars, we know that by targeting certain individuals, taking them out of commission, uh, we'll see crime drop in a certain area if we, if we deal with that. But one thing that's really helped us in Vancouver is our very robust analytical capability. So we've got a really good analytics program in Vancouver. We've got uh, a cadre of analysts who work for the VPD and they're giving us crime trends all the time. Like they're always on top of it. We have regular meetings talking about crime issues in the city. We have a daily meeting, we have a weekly meeting, and we have a monthly meeting where we talk about crime issues sort of you know, changing in scope at each of those meetings. But we're always on top of it. And our analysts are watching what's happening in the trends in frontline patrol operations, in sex crimes, in gang crime, in um, robbery and assault, in general investigations, youth crime, all these different areas. We have analysts, specially trained civilians, that are providing data to the frontline officers to help make us more effective. Oh, and then you respond and put resources into place to, to deal with that. Absolutely, yeah. So how important is it that you have the school liaison program and that you're now identifying youth at risk? Because I know that this has been a big push. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what is the benefit of that? Are we starting to see those results? 
Uh, we definitely are. There's a lot going on with youth, and it's an interesting topic because I think it brings us into the broader topic as well. That when you talk about crime rates, and you ask me like what's happening with violent crime and property right. crime, the other thing that's so important to remember about policing that sometimes gets lost in the conversation is that crimes, as defined by the Criminal Code, which is our you know national criminal laws of Canada. Only about 23% of what a police force does, like what Vancouver does, so just slightly less than a quarter, is actually crimes. The other 77% of things we're doing are everything else that people call the police for. That includes youth issues, that includes mental health issues, which take up a, a large proportion of our time. That includes you know, domestic disputes where there's no criminal assault, but people are arguing, neighbor disputes, missing children, Alzheimer's patients that walk away and get lost, uh, traffic accidents, a whole bunch of different things that aren't actually crime but people expect the police to respond when they call us for those incidents. So that's, that's one thing really to keep in mind when you're talking about crimes coming down, our, ca our calls for service actually aren't coming down. So there's more demand on police, even though we're doing a good job of fighting crime, there's more other stuff happening. So if violent crime's coming down, you're doing a reasonably good job yes. on uh, property crimes. Yes. Uh, and, uh, recognizing that's a very difficult trend because I, I, I suspect that as a member of the public, I have a responsibility in that as well. I need to yeah. protect my uh, my car, my home, my For my, sure. my property, uh, mm -hmm. not to, not to make it a target. Yeah. So it's trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, but what's happening with your budget? Is it still increasing? And and if so, like, how come the trend up on uh, on cost goes up, but the you know mm -hmm. <laughs> you can see that somebody could sit there and go, well, okay, you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Good. We don't have to spend more money on policing. I totally get it. Yeah. I, I understand like if somebody's taking sort of a superficial look, they would say crime's heading down, police budget's going up, what's up with that? Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, so um, yes, crime's heading in the right direction, but you need a fully staffed and robust police department in order to make that happen. That doesn't happen just by accident. In addition, it's all those other types of issues we're dealing with. You mentioned youth, so that's something I'm happy to talk about as well, but so many other things like that we have to deal with. But the other important thing to remember is that um, crime, uh, um, sorry, policing as a percentage of the city's budget has actually been at about 20% over the last 20 years. So if you go back, so the same, pretty if much. you go back to the early yeah. 1990s, it's been about 20% of the city's budget continuously and continues to be. So even though the cost of policing is going up, the cost of running the city as a whole is going up as well. Everybody's costs are going up. So we have to remember there's collective agreement increases every year. So. Right that uh, increases the budget too. And so, but is the scope of what you are delivering now considerably different than what it was 20, 25 years ago? It's quite different. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think back then there was sort of a more of a focus on the law and order, you know, black and white, uh, breaking the law, that kind of thing. Now the police department, and I'm going to give a lot of credit to um, a lot of the social agencies we work with and also to the police board who really, you know, want us to have a focus on some of these uphill drivers of crime. So, you know, things like homelessness, addiction, alcoholism, mental health issues, um, those types of things drive a lot of our issues that we deal with as police officers, both criminal in nature and non-criminal. So we're doing a lot of proactive things to get in front of those on the youth side and on the mental health side to make Vancouver safer because really our job is about public safety and public safety is a bigger umbrella of things than just the crime. It's all those other things that people call us for. This will be our final break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Thank you. I'm almost loath to bring up this topic because I worry that it's too cliche. Okay. Uh, but in light of the fact that uh, there was the attacks in Paris uh, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, everybody's on a heightened sense of alert. Yes. Um, does that change things here in Vancouver from your perspective? And what is it that as average citizens we need to know that you're doing to ensure that we continue to be a safe place to live? Sure. Yeah. So your police department, the Vancouver Police Department, I'll just let you know, is it dialed in with you know national and international events that are happening in the, the terrorism front? We have strong connections with the RCMP and with other security agencies in Canada, with the Department of National Defense, with CSIS, all of those, uh, all those different agencies. We sit on the Counterterrorism National Security Committee in Ottawa. We have Vancouver Police officers that are part of the Integrated National Security Enforcement Team. So that's a joint effort with the RCMP. We have VPD officers that work on that team dealing with any kind of national security or uh, counterterrorism type issues. 
We also have officers at VPD that are specially trained so that they're called counterterrorism information officers. And they're regular patrol officers. You would never know them from another officer. But they have special training. So when they go to calls and they see things that are a little bit untoward, it could be a literature or a flag or something that somebody says or, you know, a video that's playing in the background, whatever it is, something that they clue in on and say that's, you know, something that's related to, you know, radicalization or extremism. They know those precursors to look for. And then we have detectives as well that are specially trained in that to a very high level. So we've got a natural flow from the street to our detectives, to the inset teams if we need to, to that national um, entity that I was talking about earlier. And for example, when Paris happened, we had conference calls going on, we had email connections, we had interactions right away regionally, provincially, and nationally. And the good thing is that there is no nexus to Canada and there's no th elevated threat to Vancouver. Canada already is at a medium threat level after the October 2014 mm -hmm. attacks in Quebec and um, on Parliament Hill. Right. So we're already at an elevated level, but there's nothing at this point for Vancouverites to be overly concerned about other than, you know, general awareness. You know, you talked about seeing something that might be an indication of radicalization. Yes. Is an ability to intervene there similar to the strategy that you have with mental health, that you get out ahead of it? Mm -hmm. uh, you notice a particular... Uh, concern and then you address mm -hmm. it right um, and and are you being effective in that in that area right so uh, with the counterterrorism strategy I mean obviously responding to something is one aspect of it but that's after something's already happened but preventing it or denying an attack from happening that is something that we are all over mm -hmm. so in addition to having specially trained officers and having good connections with other agencies excuse me we also have a program in Vancouver which is a provincial program now but it was started by VPD we partnered up with the RCMP and it's called Project Securus. And that's where we go around to um, different businesses that may be dealing with commodities or things that could be of interest to people that would be interested in committing some kind of a terrorist act. And we give training to their employees and say, okay, if you've got, you know, it could be like at a home supply store, it could be at a medical supply store, it could be, you know, people at the airport, people that we provide specialized training to. And it's really um, just being aware of suspicious activities and sometimes people may see something and say wow like that's that's very odd that that person is purchasing that much of that particular thing or it's very odd that this person is acting in a certain way and letting them know that you know it's okay just to report that and let you know if you've got your spider senses are going off and something's not sitting right with you that here's the process you can go through 99% of the time everything works out fine but you know there are cases where we get um, good information that actually leads to something that you know is quite serious. And that brings us back to Robert Peel again, then, mm -hmm. because that's working with the community and the community working with the police. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other part of that is having good connections. You know, the first thing we talked about is having officers um, that connect well with different communities. So we do have outreach to many different communities in Vancouver, all different community groups. We meet with them on a regular basis and we talk about issues that uh, may impact their community. You know, for example, like when the Paris attacks happen, there are, you know, members of the Muslim community in Vancouver who are concerned about you know potential retribution or what public perception may be and those sorts of things so we meet with those groups and you know we have good contacts with them and try and put their because you need to be there at, for them as well absolutely yeah. for yeah. sure isn't that fabulous well i think that you're doing an amazing job i love calling vancouver home <laughs> and i have to tell you that i feel safe uh, virtually everywhere i go i appreciate so, that thank you very much and thank I, you i wish you and the men and women of the vancouver police force all the best thanks Stu. thanks